Welcome back to Your Story Medicine. Today, I am with Des Davis, who is a transformational thought leader, speaker, and creator of The Rich Witch Life, a coaching and consulting company based in Los Angeles. For over a decade, Des has studied and applied practices of energy psychology, neuro-linguistic programming, and advanced transformational transformational coaching to ignite the impact, income, and influence potential of purpose-driven entrepreneurs, service providers, and established community organizers. She draws upon her dynamic life experience as a queer woman of color and unique expertise as a spiritually centered, high performance entrepreneur to champion a new era of inclusivity, awakened wealth creation, and heart-centered leadership in business. Des, your bio is a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm like hearing you read it. I'm just like, mm, and one might need to cut that back a little bit. I'm like, this is a tongue twister. Yes, and it's it is. So juicy and magical. I should just it's be like, juicy, Des, but it's a tongue twister. Des is, is the rich witch life. All right. And yeah, and that's, that's it. That's it. That's it. Honestly, honestly, June, anytime somebody's like, so Des, what do you do? Tell me about your work. I'm just like, oh. like, you know, what do I say? Today, I can't. Today, I can't explain and I, it. And I won't. No, I'm just kidding. You just yeah. have to experience it for yourself. Honestly, I'm an experience. <laughs> no, it's fine. Put that in the bio for next time. Yeah. Des Davis is an experience. Mm -hmm. Enter the rich, witch life. So with that being said, yeah. um, I actually, I just want to jump straight. Yeah, let's well, no, no, no. It. Let's start. Let's start celebration. Celebration because we are so under celebrated. So what are you celebrating about yourself today? What am I celebrating about myself today? a great check-in I need to like mm -hmm. actually check in give me one moment hmm. I'm celebrating feeling really um, vibrant and good in my body today movement kind of fell off of my plate on my day-to-day -day routine for for a couple weeks there um, and today I'm just feeling so good in my body. And I just mentioned the, the health challenges and invitations that I've been experiencing recently. One of them being, um, the experience of chronic fatigue. And so today mm -hmm. feeling vibrant and feeling, um, solid in my body. I'm really celebrating that right now. Mm -hmm. I feel good to celebrating that with you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm feeling really good that, you know, yeah. feeling good in the body, in my body is something that I took for granted growing up. I was an athlete, a very serious athlete. So, um, my experience of being in my body was always one that was like strong and a lot of, um, physical energy being exerted. And so to have such a contrasting experience of my body over the past year, it's been extremely humbling. Um, and moments like today where I can just sit in my chair with one leg up and crossed and another one down and there's nothing hurting or aching or whatever is just awesome, you know? And I attribute that to my body and I attribute that to my, my willingness to feel good in my body and celebrating that. Yeah, people have this misconception I guess I, I can only speak for myself that like yes I have an athletic body yes I love to work out and I I love doing hit workouts I love doing all the things that make me sweat mm -hmm. hot yoga give me the weights and healer after healer has told me that I need to be doing the opposite of that I need to be doing more resting and mm -hmm. digesting. I actually have a very difficult time with yin yoga, mm -hmm. restorative yoga, because it's just like, but, uh, I have shit to do. Like, mm -hmm. this is not productive. Mm -hmm. And also, I feel like this past year especially has not just invited me, but forced me 
to sit with that and to feel all the stuff that is coming up and recognize that when I give myself permission to be in that place, to feel the discomfort and not focus on just, we were talking about this before, just like, just like working out the muscles, but recognizing that the muscles are working out in the Mm -hmm. rest. That's when the growth is going to happen. That's when they build up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's when the endurance, that's when the stamina comes in. That's when the strength builds. Um, And it reminds me actually, like in the context of business, um, like when we're not building, what are we doing? right? Are we not then feeling and experiencing what we've created? And I think that that overdrive that I've been in that manifested in my body eventually is like building focused um, and going into overdrive in order to build something and willing to be in overdrive because I'm building something. Um, I realized that actually I wasn't, I was better at building than at feeling and experiencing what I had built, right? Mm -hmm. And so getting better at creating than having that which I've actually created became the sort of issue. Um, And this missing piece in my experience of being now successful in business, financially, impact-wise, et cetera, um, that it was important for me to also learn how to go... um, horizontal and not just vertical all the time hence why we open up with celebrations because it's so easy to jump into the next thing talk about what is it that we're building taking a pause and be like you know what in this moment I have a lot to celebrate and it doesn't have to always be business related though in today's conversation we are going to be talking about so many of the intersections between the business the personal and the spiritual versus feeling like we need to compartmentalize and like like, ugh, so, so much medicine on this path. And we know that medicine can be very bitter. So uh, if you could take your title out of, I guess, I, the co- title of the coach, title of the rich witch, uh, how would you describe your medicine? Soothsayer, emotional alchemist or emotional alchemy. Um, onic, right? Tincture, sort of the format that I like to be delivered in. Open up your mouth, tilt your head back, lift your tongue, receive this, right? Small dose of big potent medicine that's going to work through your tissues and your veins and reach you in a deep way um, and deliver you to a moment of reconciliation and alignment so that way you can get back to whatever you're getting back to you know the way that you work with flower essences for instance mm-hmm. I think it's so badass whenever I I meet other entrepreneurs of color who are also super witchy because I mean let's just be real we a lot of the the healers that I know probably you know it's it's like either you are a healer and a witch mm-hmm. um or you're like more on the uh or you're the opposite of that like business cannot be spiritual if I step into entrepreneurship I have to be masculine I have mm-hmm. to hustle I can't be in the rest and digest and also we can't just sit on our fucking meditation pillows and and like pray that everything is going to work out granted there's an aspect of that yeah but I'm curious if your family came from that background of Mm. entrepreneurship what is your ancestral lineage and how did this impact your way of life today yeah yeah I think that a lot of people of color in America, their ancestors have been some form of entrepreneur, right? Because essentially being an entrepreneur is to monetize a skill or a gift that you have um, or a calling. I think the profundity in me being able to monetize my spiritual gifts 
is that that isn't always something that, you know, at an ancestral level, my grandfather, his father, my grandmother, their, her mother was able to perhaps monetize her gifts, but certain her spiritual gifts, but certainly doing hair, sewing, um, growing food. You know, these are things that I would consider are entrepreneurial in nature, even if they haven't necessarily been supported by society as such, or even seen in exchange and payoff as such. Um, but ancestrally, on my mother's side, my ancestral lineage has roots in the, in the Caribbean, specifically Dominica, Montserrat, Portugal. Um, my grandfather's side is from the deep south. So, you know, the Caribbean is full of magic, honey. You know, so where I bring in rituals and routines into the work that I do with my clients, um, it certainly empowers me and comforts me and feels affirming to know that uh, those rituals and routines and the cycles that I work with have a deeper level of contact for me um, than perhaps what I was aware of. I mean, I just found out about our ancestral lineage less than three years ago. Right. So this is a very recent relationship with specific parts of the world that my family's come from. And I think like a lot of people of color um, in America it, that are African-American, it's sort of like that's the limitation of our ancestry. We don't always know where we come from in Africa or where in the uh, Caribbean, et cetera. So. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So where did you get the inspiration or the download to become the rich witch? So it was a cute name say, that cut, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say like, was it, was it like, uh, were you one day just like, okay, I'm gonna start a business and, uh, uh, or were you, would you say you were already a witch? And then you're like, all right, I got to figure out how I'm going to pay the bills and make money I from just, this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wish that my business started like so consciously and intentionally. You know, I, I was working a nine to five. I was actually um, a, an assistant manager and got unfairly demoted to like five hours a week after being full time. And so to say that I needed to make the ends meet is an understatement. And growing up, I had seen my mom do Reiki and give readings and do what? tarot and all of this. And so um, when I needed to, you know, hustle up, a, hustle up a little change, that was my, my go-to was like, let me start doing readings. Let me start doing chakra healing and energy work, et cetera, et cetera. And so I started doing that. And um, I think just consistently practicing my energy work and my capacity to be intuitive and psychic, et cetera, and giving people advice naturally then rolled into what became coaching. I actually didn't know that coaching existed. Um, but when I found out, I was like, actually, this is an element of what I'm doing and I can charge more for it. At the time, this is 10 plus years ago. So at the time, coaching was still sort of that like random thing that wasn't really cool. And it was an excuse for not getting a real job and all of this and energy work was so woo woo that it was like, yeah. you could get, you know, ostracized in a room for trying to bring spirit into business at that time. And so um, when I found out about coaching, it was kind of a, it was, it was, an, I weighed my pros and cons of going energy work route or going coaching route and coaching route seemed to be the more solid, secure path to go down. And first I was just doing a lot of, um, I called myself a self-realization mentor or self-actualization mentor. You know, you go through all the titles. Oh, what title um, do I pick? <laughs> you feel me? I went through all of them for years. Mm -hmm. um, and I just found that I really loved working with other heart-centered entrepreneurs I found, or other heart-centered creatives, service providers, people who were wanting to be more devotional in their career or in their professional world to something that was bigger and had um, a larger connotation of impact than just what they could do um, at a single company in exchange for money. And so 
I was starting to do that work. I was on unemployment. That ran out, honey. And I had to get a job. And as spirit would have it, no less, I was perfectly and divinely arranged to be um, working in a company that, long story short, put me in the intersection between um, high ticket sales, women and womanhood, and justice because they were on some foul shit at this place. And me and two other women ended up um, having a class action, winning this, that, and the other. And it was, again, my first taste of sort of these things all coming together. Um, and that's when the Rich Witch was born, was this idea of um, empowered, magical, spiritually centered, devotional women monetizing their gifts and their desire to see people well and to empower them to be in a position to thrive and do that work. Um, and that's what the Rich Witch essentially is. It's a cute little cheeky name, but it really holds depth and weight in its intention and in its capacity to facilitate leaders, honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you also work with established community organizers and as a, I, I don't know, I say like as a former community organizer myself, but also I feel like what I'm doing today as an entrepreneur, as a coach running my own group programs mm -hmm. is essentially community organizing. I'm rallying totally. people together. It may not be for a particular campaign, but I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm organizing y'all to step into your medicine, step into mm -hmm. your magic. So what has been your experience like working with people who have a, 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 a very strong calling to, uh, to address injustice and mm. heal their relationship with money. Mm. Because if we keep it real, that's actually one of the trickiest intersections is social justice and money and how community organizers and activists relate to and relate to themselves inside of that space. Um, it's always emotional freedom work. It's always emotional freedom work. It's about how to step into a relationship with injustice backed up by the larger context of the universe shifting and evolving us and that we're in a moment in time that is not reflecting the complete whole of where we're headed and how to be in a place of perhaps progress over perfection and to not let the potential for the justice that isn't yet drive them literally crazy or disembody or disassociate because it seems so surmounting the issue at hand. And so it is a, uh, it's, a, it's the work of emotional freedom to be able to delineate and to create some healthy detachment and to be able to do your work um, without letting your potential haunt you. And I think that that isn't just for community organizers, but I think that that's honestly for anyone that's heart-centered and that has anti-capitalist values. But also I think we do need to transition from just like what's beyond anti-capitalist values, right? And that I think becomes a part of the conversation when I do that work. So let's talk about that. What is beyond anti-capitalism? Because we see it everywhere. Dismantle capitalism and get, I gotta make money. And I don't want to be seen as a sellout if I step into yeah. this. I don't want to well, get canceled. I don't want to well, get called out. <laughs> and those things, those things are emotional though. Mm. Those are emotional. And it does tap on sort of our sense of security and survival and belonging and acceptance. And so it's primal, yeah. right? And that's where we get into, um, again, the emotional freedom work. Is that so root chakra work? It is. The, it is. Um, what's beyond capitalism is actually what existed before capitalism, 
right? This is a constant, go ahead, were you about to say something? Well, well I mean, well, and, and people will say, well, that means that we didn't have money. We just traded services. Mayans had I, money, Egyptians had money. Mm -hmm. You know, it actually, mm -hmm. some of the greatest mm -hmm. civilizations that were abundant and spiritually sovereign had some sort of financial monetary system. Absolutely. Yeah, I know for the Mayans, it was cacao. Uh, for other communities, it was gold. But yeah, there, was, I, okay, there was gold, precious metals. Mm -hmm. um, and it's resource exchange, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And by the time that like coins are created and all of these other things, um, I see that as a diverse, like a, it's like almost like a diversifying of ways to be in resource exchange because we mm -hmm. still to this day might do, hey, session for session, right? Yeah. And that's still research, resource exchange. Um, at the same time, we pay our bills using money. And so mm -hmm. what we're templatizing here that existed before capitalism is the idea that we are gifted, we are uniquely embodied with these gifts and that they are valid and valuable and that we can be in exchange and live, thrive copiously from the exchange of our gifts with other gifted individuals, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the template that we're taking from. And I wanna say perhaps it's resurging now because this is sort of an ancient future type of a technology, right? It's the idea that um, what I have to offer is something that someone else needs. And that that in and of itself gives me a right to offer that thing and to want to be really successful in the offering of that thing in a way that also supports the success and the thriving and the well being of everyone else. The challenge I see, especially in BIPOC communities, is this notion of if. Oh, oh, so and so is creating something similar already. So I can't do it anymore. It's as if one person thriving is taking away from somebody else. Yeah. And that's and capitalism. It's that's, capitalism. That's, that's, that's capitalism. I don't think that the market is oversaturated. I actually mm -hmm. feel really encouraged. Like I'm flanked from my left, right, side to side, up and down, back and front with other earth angels who are out here doing their thing. Looks mm -hmm. like it's our time. You know what I'm saying? And so capitalism says there needs to be like a dominant producer of this product that monopolizes a space and everyone underneath is trying to beat out that company or whatever it is will mimic a product and that that product in its mimicked version is not the original it is not as valuable and that's the, that's what i'm saying is a part of the issue that when we move beyond anti-capitalist values and beliefs we, we an emerging paradigm of everyone has value and we're no longer fighting for value. We're no longer trying to prove um, and affirm our validity and our reason for being here. We're then just being here and offering it. And so I understand it's a bit, it's a bit of a consciousness shift, right? It's a little bit of a stretch, but what about this? But what about that? Well, we could be here with the but what abouts forever. And there's this existing paradigm that precedes and proceeds capitalism that ancient spiritual civilizations have been thriving off of for thousands of years. Do we want a peace? That's all I'm saying. And how do we do that today in its 2021 version? It's not less available by any means. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Okay. You know, I yes. challenge sometimes. Well, <laughs> yes. Well, and I feel like this has been my biggest shift as well, because when I first stepped into business, fresh out of working a nonprofit, rape crisis hotline, uh, married to the struggle into 
what are people going to think of me when I start selling myself? And my, my first year in business, I was focused on trauma healing. And then I realized I don't want to do that. Why? Because what did I end up attracting? Yeah. Yeah. Words cast spells, right? I attracted a lot of trauma. And I was like, yeah. dang, I don't want to do this anymore. And then the moment I shifted into calling forth what I wanted for my life and giving people the invitation to dream beyond the trauma, to dream beyond the tr- the struggle, that's when I started attracting a very different energy, yeah. different caliber of people who are like, yes, I... I am invested in, in something greater that may not even be seen in my lifetime. And in the beginning, it was very much like, oh, I'm broke. I need the money. Mm-hmm. And what ended up happening is that, yes, there were people who who worked with me. And I'm reflecting back on like, oh, so much of it is what I was taught mm-hmm. from other coaches who were operating in scarcity of like, you know, you gotta, you gotta get them on the phone. You gotta like get their credit Uh, cards. And then what, and what unfolded was that that's that scarce energy leaked into the container. It leaked into my energy because I was not coming from that place of abundance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And fast forward four years into business for me, it is now so important that I put the human being first. Mm-hmm. That I put the spiritual being and their needs first. I don't want you to have to feel like you need to choose between paying your rent mm-hmm. and working with me. That is not the game that we are playing mm-hmm. here. And also, mm-hmm. I trust that if I'm not the one for you, that you will find the soul aligned person for you in this moment because I'm here for the long haul. Yes. And I will refer you to Des if I feel like <laughs> this is somebody who is in better alignment with where it is you're at because there gets to be more of us. I'm not going to hoard you to myself. Come back next year. It's all good. I will be here ready to receive you when you're ready. Mm -hmm. And that energetic shift for myself from that scarcity to abundance is what actually scaled me to six figures. And I know is going to scale me to multiple six figures because, because I'm here to see all of us win. Mm-hmm. It's all good. Like, like probably both you and I, we work with maybe like 20, 30 clients at the most a year. A year. Right. Yeah. And, and we see so many other people in our community who want to be accessible, end up charging lower, but then attracting folks who, uh, I mean, okay, that's, let me take that back because it's, it's completely okay if that's where you're at. And also, if you are doing that from that place of scarcity, it's like the universe responds Mm -hmm. to that. Well, well, and even before we like get personify the universe, right? Mm. The energy just responds. Mm -hmm. The energy, this is an an energetic thing, right? The universe isn't like, oh, you scarce? Well, (laughs) I'll wait. You know what I mean? The universe, I think, is always meeting you in its abundance, in your abundance, in its abundance, because that's what it is. But abundance at that moment can look different than the abundance that you had four years later. The abundance in your willingness to get educated, do these sessions X, Y, and Z, and implement what you learn. The abundance in re-unlearning that and then clicking, unlearning, and then clicking into your own... um, I want to use the word being a disciple of your own intuition, right? Mm-hmm. Self-discipline to then establish how you want to make money in your business. That that's actually just a sovereign move that then the energy is responding to that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, because $500 can be abundance for you energetically and, and lean into that versus saying like, uh, and that's, that's something that I had to learn. For mm-hmm. myself too, because my nervous system was not ready to charge for yes. figures in the beginning. And it yeah. was unfair. Yeah. I didn't feel safe receiving. Receiving that. And I think that that sort of, this conversation is two pronged because on the one end, there's like what I had to learn 
and do that I ultimately saw was out of alignment and unsustainable for me as a heart-centered entrepreneur and then how I needed to course correct, which I think was a lot of our experience. Um, and then the sense of being, of feeling othered and why can't I do what everybody else is able to do and why can't I market in this way and launch this way and et cetera, et cetera. Well, because I need to operate and lead from heart first, human first. That mm -hmm. is actually the abundant strategy for me. Um, so I think that that's, that's one conversation, but then I also think that the second level conversation is um, some of our ult emotional ulterior motives and why we charge what we charge. If we are charging too low, we're doing that to avoid rejection or hearing no's or hearing that we're doing, we're charging too much and that that's causing harm or that we're being complicit in capitalist values and all this and that we're selling out and da 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 da, da. So now we'll charge too low because of that emotional reason and motivator that actually is sending the message to us the biofeedback is i will struggle if it means that emotionally i'm receiving like the emotional currency of acceptance and belonging so what happens when the emotional currency and the financial currency match Right. I want to say, then we find resonance, even if that's not six figures yet, mm -hmm. even if it's not seven figures, even if it's not, I've worked with seven figure entrepreneurs who are still overworking and undercharging, but they make seven figures. Mm. It's really about the quality and the way in which they're working and what they feel like they need to do in order to generate that and the biofeedback and the messaging that that consecrates inside of themselves and the way that that then acts as confirmation bias to their, their unchecked, resol unresolved pain, right? So you could charge whatever you wanna charge. Mm -hmm. And if you are not in emotional resonance, no matter how much money you're making or not making, you know, and when that becomes the press and that becomes the like the non-negotiable baseline, I think then you're willing to do the work to move and have your being and to create financial abundance in alignment with yourself. And then you're no longer in comparison to what the market is doing or what um, your colleagues are doing or what entrepreneurs like you are doing. You're in your own lane and in your own zone of genius. And then you're nurturing your own quantum timeline. And that to me, I think is where the satisfaction comes in at every phase of development in business. Mic drop to that. Yes. Yeah, so everybody who's listening, I don't want you to feel like, oh, I'll be abundant when I hit the six, when I hit the seven figures. To be honest, those numbers are way too often overrated because what is the point of generating any money in your life if you are first not feeling abundant? Because for me, abundance looks like being able to take a pause in the middle mm -hmm. of the day to go for a walk, to eat with my friends, to not get on my plane to Hawaii because I want to continue being nourished by the land, right. to cultivate deep relationships with people mm -hmm. and to, to just trust, trust mm -hmm. that everything is working in my highest good and that I am worthy, that you are worthy with or without the numbers in your bank account. Mm -hmm. And let's not get it twisted. It's hard to access relaxation when you are financially struggling or stressed. Mm -hmm. That's actually, that was the impetus for me committing to, it was like 2016, 2017. I was like, I actually think I need to make becoming wealthy a conscious, intentional goal. It can't just be this thing that I hope happens if I like show up with my full heart and do X, Y, and Z. I had to make that a goal. I make six figures off referrals because I intended to make six figures maybe not the how that kind of like played out the way that it played out, yeah. but it was intentional. It was it, it, wealth creation. Isn't always just this thing that happens to people. And I think that that can be like the myth and some of the allure and like the way that Hollywood and media has positioned 
the collective to relate to uh, how to make money, how to create wealth is like, it happens to you because you're chosen because you work in a way that makes you valuable enough to um, grant you a lot of money, right? And you were able to um, opt into what was expected of you. And that's why you're being rewarded and chosen mm. to have wealth. And I think that even as entrepreneurs, where we know that like these structures aren't choosing us, but that clients choose you or that the market chooses you or whatever it is, even that I think can be really toxic thinking. You know, and I think that it can be really self-defeatist thinking when it comes to money. And so there's nothing wrong with wanting to intentionally create money because it's a strategy for living and loving your life totally and completely unencumbered, complete presence, complete resources and consciousness and in bank account to continue to actualize yourself and to contribute to the evolution of life on earth. That it's just a strategy, you know, um, because I can do this sometimes. <laughs> well, I, well, this is a perfect segue into weaving magic into our business. And you and I were talking about spell casting and how everything begins with first that intention. So for you, it was the intention of, I am going to make six figures. Why? Because I cannot rest when I am struggling. <laughs> yes. I cannot rest when I'm stressed. Yeah. And, and in order for a spell to be casted and to manifest in this physical realm, not only do we need to set our intention, but we got to make some sacrifices. We got to do the work. We got to do the work and gotta... sacrifice can sound like such martyrdom, mm -hmm. but Okay, what is it that you had to sacrifice in order for you to step into the rich witch life? I have had to sacrifice pain avoidance. I've had to sacrifice habits of urgency. I've had to sacrifice codependence. I've had to sacrifice people taking care of me in ways that fill me up in ways that fill me up from my childhood. Right. Um, I've had to give up stopping because something doesn't feel good, you know, um, I've had to give up a lot of things that kept me safe and in relationship and surviving with a lot of loved ones, familiar environments and communities. You know, I've probably died about 20 times <laughs> running this business. You know what I mean? Like, like the I, not the physical, right? Clearly, yeah, yeah. but like the sense of who am I has undergone um, extreme rites of passage. I mean, truly, when we talk about manifestation, we're talking about quantum timeline work. We're talking about nervous system work. We're talking about lower chakras. We're talking about um, brain, neurobiology, right? Um, whole self regeneration to be able to articulate a shift in consciousness. Whoa, you know, um, and of course, everything that I'm saying I'm giving up is like, oh, well, good. I'm glad that you gave those things up. Of course you gave those things up. But like, actually a lot of what I'm calling those like intense labels, codependency, this and the other, mm -hmm. um, they don't always look like codependency. There are levels of codependency that you only have to check if you've decided to live a devotional life. 
they, they won't even really come onto your radar unless you are willing to be that devotional to your higher calling. That's when the context of that kind of work comes in and becomes necessary. Otherwise, you can honestly live a really great life without even checking those levels of emotional attachment. Well, <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's even like so, so business as a catalyst to healing, mm -hmm. healing that relationship with ourselves, our own sense of security, worthiness, and belonging. A belonging, right, is such like the the thing like I want to create spaces of belonging and then something that I wasn't prepared for mm. early on in my business is the grief that came with letting go of clients or students who just were ready to get set free into the world I had to mm. release my own codependency yes. of like but I just want you to stay in my life forever and yeah. then also releasing this narrative that my relationships are only possible when they're transactional. Like that's mm. some colonial BS that even mm. I've had to unlearn that I was initially taught from other coaches. Like mm. your clients cannot be your friends. That's crossing mm. a boundary. And I feel like I've worked through that now yeah. where I'm like, hey, like this relationship is more than transactional. Yeah. Like, I may not be coaching you on, on your business or your story, but like, dude, I created my business in order to have more soul fulfilling relationships mm -hmm. and to also just like be okay with you being free. So how is it that with you sacrificing so many of these narratives, business has become this vehicle this catalyst to your own healing, recognizing mm -hmm. that healing is not an end destination. Right, right. Because actualization is not an end destination. And I think that that's actually the, the, the point and that healing happens as a part of that, right? So to me, business is um, a path to actualize yourself, honestly. And that as a part of that, healing is a component, but the constant ing on that heal honey like we got to know how to go from healing to healed to operating from that healed space and what is that what is the name of that right um and holding space for others even as we're going through our own journeys and and no 100 100 <laughs> well i think that that's also the piece is like Again, when it comes to the, you know, from capitalism's perspective, everything is about qualifying, right? So if you're going through healing, you're no longer qualified to teach X, Y, and Z because you're not perfect, because you're not um, the example anymore, right? When actually me being here at the altar of grief is making me so lucid and aware that I'm tasting, touching, and feeling, and I'm deep in the soils of this and can help you navigate these uncharted territories if I set myself up to work in, 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 in through conditions that are actually conducive to that kind of exchange. So this is where it comes down to, no, going through healing does not disqualify you from doing the coaching work, but will you do that coaching work in a way that actually is conducive to your and their healing? Or are you gonna work in a way that is codependent and collapses your healing into their success results? And I mean, when it comes to coach method training with my clients, that's a major portal that we go through is clearing and healing your codependency. Where are you a coach to make up for what you didn't get? Where are you a champion for someone's pain because no one was a champion for you? Mm. And how can you allow there to be some time for them to be mutually exclusive, mm. right? And then eventually come, when it's time, come back together in symbiosis, right? And that happens when you've gone from healing to healed around something. And now you speak to it from that place. Mm -hmm. Ooh, 
Ooh, ooh, ooh. I feel, I feel so stripped naked right now. Uh, I hope y'all have a towel or uh, a blanket. Uh, yeah, uh, because I, I believe that everything, all, our sacred offerings are really that offering to our younger selves and what it is we wish we had at that time of our lives. And also, are you embodying the journey? Or are you just staying stuck in the pain versus versus the potential, the potential the and potential. the pleasure that's on the yes. other side of it? Yes, yes. And walking alongside the journey of your client, of your student, of your mentee without feeling like you need a front about like, I'm still learning, too. It's OK. Yeah. Let's and walk you, this path together. And you will be forever. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, in a recent meditation, my higher self said to me, humility is the sanctuary where innocence and mastery come together in harmony. And I really feel like humility keeps us willing to learn. And creates this space where growth is always a part of the deal. And I think that practicing humility as a way to heal the perfectionism that capitalism and cis white patriarchy has taught all of us. You know, the perfectionism that has us turn on ourselves by overworking and undercharging and undervaluing ourselves um, in order to like earn the life that we want and to be qualified to have what we really desire. We've earned it, we've proven that we deserve it. And that's where the conversation tends to just like run on itself. But I feel like where perfectionism is going to fault me or us for what we don't already know and where we aren't already that humility is going to remind us that there's always something to learn and that we have a right to that growth. Always. And so that's where our innocence, our right to grow, always. Mm -hmm. And our mastery, our right to share what we know and to teach it and to guide and for them to not be in conflict with each other. I mean, that's our own responsibility to ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to the ancestors we're becoming. And to the ancestors that we are becoming is to be, is to be willing to develop that level of humility, mm -hmm. to not pit our innocence and our mastery against ourselves and turn on ourselves in a way that takes us out the game. Yeah. Takes us out the game. We spend our time earning and proving as opposed to evolving and expressing and fulfilling. So what is it that you are currently doing to stay grounded amidst mm -hmm. every all the layers that I'm like, oh, I thought it was done shedding. Damn. All right. All right. All right, guides. What else you got? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things is like, I kind of just understand that I think that that's a part of life, right? Like the trees lose their leaves every single winter. They're not like upset and grieving every single winter. You know, the loss of the leaves is a part of the deal. It's a response to the change of the earth. It's how we're staying in step. It's how we're evolving. It's how we remain congruent with cycles and within cycles. And so, yes, there's always another thing that we're molting in, in a metamorphosis around in a movement around. Um, and it's been a really, it's been a really exceptionally high sensation kind of a year and a half for us, two years, you know, and, and it might be three to five years where we're still feeling the echo and we're in the echo chamber of, of what's just broken open and happened and what's emerging. Um, 
And so I say this because it's the foundation for my mindset right now. It's the foundation for how I'm staying rooted and staying grounded, which is like, look, keep it real. If something is um, uncertain and when it's going to resolve and what it will resolve into, then where's my resolve right now? Let me anticipate the quality of resolve that is natural, that is always in cycle, that is on its way at some point. How do I anticipate it and embody it in this moment? And for me, that's looking like a lot of somatic nourishment, like rest, sleep rest, physical rest, um, and like letting my actual body turn on again, right? Because I, I was very in, I was mentally focused, very mentally focused, very psychically, energetically, mentally focused, very disconnected from the body. Um, and I was seeing a lot of rewards, right? From operating in that way. I still hit my numbers. I'm still seeing certain results that I wanted, but deeply out of alignment. So I'm reconciling and making amends right now um, with my body and through listening to my body and remembering, like remembering as in like coming back in, member, remembering with my body, listening to what's a body versus a head level yes or a no. And then when I follow the body no, which I see as like this interesting pendulum that surprises you, the body doesn't like go into autopilot like that. It really is like, what is a no yesterday could be a yes today or three hours later. Um, and so the more that I like witnessed how honoring my true yes, my true no at the body versus head level started to activate all this alignment in other parts of my life, it became like the new way of doing things, right? And understanding that getting back into my body allowed me to get back into resonance with the earth and how the earth works and getting back into resonance with how the earth works actually surprisingly connected me with more of like the interstellar blueprint that the earth is operating off of. So now I'm experiencing this return to this totality of attunement and connection with the systems as within uh, are without and as without are within. Um, so that was really powerful, but also a lot of psychological and emotional rest, like divesting from unhealthy expectations of myself and other people um, and of the world right now. Like, why are we expecting ourselves to run when we just started flipping over on our backs, right? If some of us just started crawling, like, let's just be at the crawl right now and like love that and be really present with that. And, um, and like disengaging honestly from anything or anywhere that feels demanding versus mm. inviting. <laughs> I'm a 6'2 projector. So I'm the role model hermit projector, which operates through invitation. That's my strategy. I really actually have received a lot of, um, juicy self insight and clarification getting into human design. So like, how do I facilitate invitations for myself and the depth of connection with my intuition and what my body level, yes or no, that inner pendulum um, to be able to know when invitations come in, in abundance, which ones are the right ones in the right time to say yes to. Um, and I would say the last thing is like a lot of lower chakra healing in the nervous system work. You know, um, we love the prestige of the higher chakras, don't we? Oh, we love it. And we love it in this country because we love mm -hmm. prestige, because we love powers that make us valuable, that prove our worth, that make us a star, right? And so not like any of those things aren't fun, flirty concepts, but... You know, the, the truest truth that I could say here is you will achieve great things from a completely misaligned place within yourself. You will achieve those mm. great things, honey. Don't doubt that. Oh, you will achieve them. But will you be whole into yourself? That honestly becomes the question and the anchor for me. So lower chakra work. Mm. And... Um, and it really, the nervous system rewiring that comes with the lower chakra work 
um, because we've all heard and sort of seen and we find value in the idea of the body keeping the score, but to really engage in that work, to really, to really check out the scoreboard um, and to do the healing and the clearing and the reconciliation and the alignment work, that's next level. Um, and so it's a lot of technique based. That's where the energy psychology work comes in the somatic techniques, et cetera. Yeah, clear the gut to clear yeah. the mind because how can you even follow your intuition when there's just so much stagnation that's happening in there? I'm on that journey too. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I hit all of these goals. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I need to come back down to earth. It's not, yeah, this doesn't feel abundant. I did all the things that I said I was going to do and uh, come back to the self, come back to the why, come back to the root, my mm -hmm. own root. Um, I just had like one, one client where like we mapped out the rest of her year and her launch. And then uh, I'm going to be bringing her on the podcast. She just reconnected with her biological family mm. after like adopted and just now got invited to go be with them in Hawaii for a month. And I'm like, wait a minute. So the month you're going to be there is the same month that you say you want to launch your program. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Like th this is a part of the root chakra healing where you are reconnecting with your ancestors, with your family, the business can wait. If anything, your business is going to blossom even more because you are choosing to embody your medicine so let that like screw it like everything we just created scrap it postpone it till next year yeah it'll be fine <laughs> yeah yeah I mean and honestly that is the practice of my coaching it's just like I I really I'm a business coach with an emphasis on whole self-actualization which yes. means when you sit on the zoom with me and the whole of your guides, guardians, teachers, and ancestors are coming to the table with you. And I'm here holding a space for you to do your work. It is going to, what's the right word? It is going to invite you down to the cellular level to be authentic to yourself, to the process and to yourself in process. And so if energy precedes strategy, then we can lay out this strategy that isn't even in accordance with the energy that you're currently embodying. So mm -hmm. I'm going to create a strategy that precedes the energetic state of awareness that you're in right now. So we gotta do the work to have you in congruence with the strategy that was just created. Yeah. And sometimes that calls you home. It's always going to call you to the altar. But sometimes it calls you home. And sometimes it calls you into your childhood. And sometimes it calls you into your grief. And sometimes it calls you into your trauma. Sometimes it calls you into the potential that you're not able to tolerate the sensation of. It's going to call you into your nervous system. Yeah. So what is a ritual or practice that you can invite people to start with as they are learning to drop from the higher mm -hmm. to the lower chakra so that they can listen to that intuition that is already deep within them, guiding them before they go forth yeah. and say like, okay, Des, I want to work with you. Or Jupe, okay, okay, I'm ready to work with you. Well, I, I think what, what's coming through to say is something that is fundamental to your practice of life experience, which I think is the mind-body nervous system relationship, cultivating a relationship with your mind-body nervous system, and then using the techniques like tapping, subconscious release technique, neuro-linguistic programming, somatic hold um, techniques that literally leverage the technology of your body. So that way you can start to get out of conflict between body and mind 
they can be on the same team. So that way your capacity to listen deeply, your ability to hear yourself is that much more amplified. Because I think most people's intuition and their conditioned mind and or current mindset are what are in conflict with each other. And that's what makes the listening so difficult is trying to um, figure out which one to go with. Right. And so if you can get these major guardians, these systems of yours on the same team, your body, your mind, your energy, et cetera, on the same team using these techniques, then your endogenous spiritual technologies start to take over and they start to move your sense of awareness into um, territories that are expanded beyond your current um boundary of consciousness or limitation of conscious circumference of consciousness. So you've got to get into these techniques that get you back into your body, turn your body on because your body is this like miraculous spaceshipy kind of technology <laughs> that knows how to organize energy. It knows how to organize thought. It knows how to organize feeling and sensation. Um, but without the body being really attuned in and, and, and turned on and tapped on, you know, tapped in, then um, it's hard to know of all of the intelligence that is trying to speak to you and reach you, which one to go with and how. Yeah. And the body is emitting this frequency that is both attracting and repelling yeah. simultaneously, yeah. right? Which is why it's so important that before we even talk about strategy, we get right with that energy, we get very clear on what it is we're calling in, what our intention is, mm -hmm. what it is we are willing to sacrifice or compost so that we can take those lessons and turn it into fertile soil for our growth. Mm -hmm. So where's it for, for people who are ready to receive the guidance, where is it that they can go to find you and like, you don't even market your services, first of all. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's no. going on? <laughs> and, I know. And Rich, I was just like, I just cast spells and then you emit the frequencies and they come. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, actually. I think when I think to myself, like, Des, what, how did you activate a referral based business? I honestly think it was, it started when I watched the movie Hitch. With Will Smith, did you see that? Do you know what I'm talking well, about? I, I have not, but but for okay. me, when I think about business, like leading from that heart centered place, what we're really doing is we're this is all about relationships. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. So in Hitch, he was like this really phenomenal coach, love coach that was deeply invested in his clients, but his number was passed around under the radar. And I think I, I sort of have this memory that I think I might be making up that I was like, I want to do that. That's so cool. And maybe that's how I activated it. But nevertheless, um, I'm actually in transition from um, only doing one-on-one -on -one to doing more group work, to doing digital programs and products, et cetera. Um, so there are a lot of exciting things that are coming out. But in terms of wanting to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, best way is to visit my website, therichwitchlife.com or send me a DM on Instagram at therichwitchlife or an email at therichwitchlife uh, at gmail.com. You don't even have G Suite. Okay, sorry. No, you know what I'm saying? Like, and this is the thing. It's like, you know, <laughs> for what meant a lot to me over the past six years in business, which was the intimacy of connection with clients and the depth of breakthrough and results and the transformation offered and studying the spiritual technologies at hand. Um, and being a student of this work for X amount of years. Um, the marketing and the systems and the funnels were not required. You know what I mean? They just weren't, they were fluff. They was extra. And I own that. And I have, and I have loved working so intimately with literally hundreds of people, hundreds, maybe even 
at least even 1200 people over the past seven years between all the different things that I've been doing, six, seven years. Um, and now it is time to make a, an, an intentional pivot in my business model, which is really an intentional pivot in what my heart is feeling called to now do and how, and what are the aligned structures in my quote unquote business that are resonant with that depth of impact that I want to make right now. Um, and so with that said, now it's time for the funnels and the team mm -hmm. and the hiring and all of that. Yeah. And what's beautiful is what's in place in consciousness and what I've learned and, and, um, the way that the same impact that I've been able to be a student of and teach for all of these years is now going to be translated and expressed in, in new ways. That's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yes. So follow the rich, rich life. And I'm just going to plug in that uh, if you go to the show notes, you can find the free downloadable mini ebook. Yeah. <laughs> Get into it. Three keys. The three keys of what? Dynamic wealth manifestation, baby, at any phase yeah. of your business, whether you're just getting started or any phase of your um, income goals, whether it's I'm wanting to break through to six figures or I'm wanting to break through to multiple six figures or seven figures, there are just some basic 101s that yeah. act as like soul level reminders that open up your energy to go ahead and have it, honey. Yeah, I want to make my first $500. I want to make my first $1,000. If that's yep. what's going to start you off with feeling abundant, yep. then that's great because then you are prepping your nervous system to receive even more. Yes. So, yes, I love me some somatic talk and nervous system and how that all ties back to uh, just like, well, yeah, we can't talk about our businesses without talking about nervous system work. Actually, that's what most people um are are not doing which is why having this conversation brings me so much joy Same, June. so uh let's now dream about ourselves as future ancestors mm. and yeah. if you can envision yourself as that future ancestor speaking to maybe present day you or that version of yourself who <laughs> who is on your mom's couch <laughs> figuring out how to build a business yeah what is it that you would say i would say you don't have to earn your keep beloved you don't have to earn your keep you are here on purpose and with a purpose that might go beyond your understanding and that there is something spiritual in play and mysterious and to let myself have fun. That's what I would say. Mm. Yeah. We love future ancestor Des and present Thank day you. and younger version. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm setting the intention that we get to frolic in the desert together. This and weekend. Yes. Let's do it. Do it. Yes. Uh yeah. I'm 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 getting I'm seeing if I can get Des to come to the desert with me to come see Landrell. Uh and yeah just live in that abundance and, mm -hmm. and 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 sweat out all of our our insecurities in over 100 degree weather let's do it <laughs> mm. Mm. yes june thank you so much for having me on i appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this ongoing dialogue that you're having through your podcast and um your questions really touched my heart and moved me and i really just appreciate you and what you're doing here Thank you. Mm. Yes, you are not alone. It is my pleasure. Yeah.